Good evening again, everyone. And it's just it's, it's an honour to be able to welcome Alan to uh, our church again for our final instalment of Galatians. Uh, I've found the last three weeks quite exciting, so I'm looking really, I'm really looking forward to this evening. Just pray for Alan, and then I'll hand the service over to him, and then Willie McLean will close the evening at the end uh, after Alan has finished. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here, your day, your house. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to sit in comfort and in peace to hear your word preached with a boldness and authority that only you can give. So, Father, we ask and we pray a blessing upon your servant, Alan, who has diligently worked and preached over these past three weeks, and he will tonight as also. So be with him, Father, please. Give him that boldness and give him that authority to preach your word and that we listen carefully and we apply it to our hearts and not only to our hearts to our, but to our daily lives. So Father we bring Alan before you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for these warm words of welcome. Uh, it won't be difficult to know where we're going to turn to. <laughs> The Epistle to the Galatians, and tonight we're going to be reading in chapter 5, Galatians and chapter 5. Galatians in chapter 5 at verse number 13, verse 13, 5 and 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an, as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do probably better practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the spirit, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, envying one another. God will bless to us the reading of his word this evening. Now, looking around this congregation, I don't think any of us would have been around at the time of the Spanish Civil War. You might find that a slightly bizarre way to begin a sermon, but I'll explain in a minute. Some of you may have already worked it out. The last few uh, battles in the Spanish Civil War related to the capture of Madrid, which was held by the uh, Republican government, and uh, the nationalist or fascist movement led by General Franco were advancing on Madrid. And one of their generals made this interesting comment that's passed into the language, and you'll sure, surely now understand where I'm going. There are four columns advancing towards Madrid, but the most important one is the fifth column, that's those who sympathize with us in the city, and when our armies come within sight, they will cast off any um, other idea they might have, and they'll join up with us and win the battle. Now, from that has come even in English the phrase fifth column and fifth columnist. I want to tell you tonight, every one of us have a spiritual fifth columnist, and he's introduced to us in this passage and he's called the flesh. That's what the flesh is. It's a spiritual fifth columnist in every one of our hearts. And Paul is at great pains here to tell us that we should walk in the spirit, lest we so that we should not gratify the desires of the flesh. So we're going to meet the flesh tonight, but trust we're also going to feel a little of the power and grace of the Holy Spirit. 
This passage, fitting it into the whole context of Galatians, as we explained, I think, last week, is really to answer the final argument of the false teachers. I think they had three arguments, and two chapters are each devoted by Paul to deal with them. The first we saw, Paul is just a second-class apostle. He's not really in the front rank, not in the Premier League at all. And Paul says, yes, I am in every bit as much an apostle as the apostles in Jerusalem. I received my apostleship from the risen, ascended Lord. And indeed, the Jerusalem apostles, as we saw in chapter 2, recognized my apostleship. Not only do they recognize my apostleship, my commission, they also recognized the message that I was bringing. Then in chapters 3 and 4, quite heavy going in some ways, Paul is answering the argument, to be part of the seed of Abraham, you need to keep the law. You need to keep the law. And remember, I think we mentioned that some of the Jews believed at that time that Abraham had kept all of the law, all the thousands of commandments, centuries before they were given. That might be part of the background to what Paul has to say here. Be that as it may, we learn that Christians now are the seed of David, are the seed of Christ, rather. Abraham's seed is Christ. And all who are in Christ share the blessings that belong to him. But then finally, in chapter 5 and 6, Paul is dealing with this argument, which I repeat, as I've said already, is still sometimes heard and certainly has been heard in times of revival and gospel blessing, which is this. How can people be expected to be good? How can people live a good life? Why do they need to live a good life when, after all, you're teaching them that they're saved by grace and grace alone? And sometimes the argument has been raised, let us continue in sin that grace may abound. My friend and colleague in Victoria, Alan MacDonald, tells a slightly amusing story in the old days of the open air in the centre of Glasgow. The open air had finished and those who had taken part were walking down Silky Hall Street and this lad accosted them. Um, whom they hadn't met before, and was probably, put it mildly, under the influence of alcohol. And as they were passing by, the police officers suddenly appeared in the scene and told them to move on. So this chap muscled his way to the front, and in the best Glaswegian accent said, We're no under the law. We we're under grace. <laughs> of, all pass of all passages to pick, you know, but you see, that's an argument that sometimes is used. And to go from one extreme to the other, that's what we call antinomianism. That you can just live as you like. If you're saved by grace, you're saved by faith alone. You can just live as you like and do as you please and live any kind of life at all. Now, Paul is answering that argument. But in the course of so doing, positively what he's saying is this. Just as the law could not justify... And you've probably heard me enough emphasizing that in the last few weeks. So in the section we have before us tonight, the law cannot sanctify. So it is powerless either to justify or sanctify. And actually an important verse in the, in the argument of the epistle is, the, is the verse 21 of chapter 3. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed by, be by the law. The problem was not with the law. God didn't give the power along with the law to fulfill it at that time. That's the point he's making there. So we need to learn tonight that just as law in general and the law of Moses in particular will not justify, so it will not sanctify. It will not make us, in other words, practically righteous. Justification is positionally righteous, but practical righteousness is what we call sanctification. That's a progressive work. We saw last week or the week before that justification is a once and for all work and you're as much justified the moment you trust Christ as you will ever, ever be, even to eternity. What a thought, by the way. What a thought. Justified freely by his grace. But sanctification is a progressive work. It's a work that goes on from day to day and hopefully, hopefully, we'll see some increase as we live our life down here. But Paul is saying, isn't he, Sanctification is not by the law, it is by the Spirit. Now, if you notice in our reading tonight, it's a fairly short reading, it's absolutely peppered, if that's the word, with the references to the Holy Spirit. Time and time again in these verses, I didn't count them, I think it was about eight or nine um, references to the Holy Spirit in this paragraph. So, take away point number one. Sanctification, Christian living, is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. 
and by him alone. And every virtue we possess, and every vir virtue we possess, and every victory won, and every thought of holiness are his alone. Now I want to see in this passage tonight three contrasts. First of all, in verses 13 to 15, license or liberty? License or liberty, they're not the same. Verses 13 to 15, indeed, they're very different. Then in verses 16 to 18, flesh or spirit, flesh or spirit. And then in verses 19 to 26, works or fruit, works or fruit. So first of all, then, the short paragraphs here, 13 to 15, license or liberty. Then flesh or spirit, verses 16 to 18. And verses 19 to 26, works, that's the works of the flesh, or fruit, that's the fruit of the spirit. So verse 13 deals with the point we've already made. You are called unto freedom, brothers, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. What Paul is saying here is this. There's a difference between liberty and license. The mistake some people sadly have made is it's, li it's license to do what they like. Do, go where they like, do what they want. But in contrast to that, Christian liberty is not being free to sin, it's being free to serve. Christian liberty is not being free to sin, it's being free to serve. To serve God, and as we see in the passage also, serve God through serving one another. Second vital point from these verses. First of all, the Holy Spirit is the only sanctifier of the people of God. Sanctification, practical righteousness comes through him and him alone, not by law, certainly not by a human little rule book, rules that we make up that you've got to conform to. And even by the holy law of Moses, no, it's the Spirit of God who sanctifies using the word of God. But here we learn that that liberty, that, that liberty is to serve God by serving others. The second point, big point from the passage, which is, I think, sometimes overlooked, a very important aspect of practical righteousness is how we relate to one another as Christians. You know, it was never God's will, that some, as some men did in the Middle Ages and maybe even before that, for folks to become hermits. To live in a cave and have no contact with anyone else and to commune with God. Maybe they generally did commune with God. But this really was never God's ideal. Convents and monasteries were never God's ideal either. One of the great truths recovered at the Reformation was not only justification by faith, but the idea that every Christian has a calling and they pursue that calling in the ordinary everyday affairs of life. I think I might have mentioned to you before that one, one was, of course, the calling of family life. And I think I did mention one of the previous messages. If you go to Wittenberg, which, is all, which I'm advertising now, you go to Wittenberg, you'll see the statue of Katrina van Vora, and she's holding her wedding ring aloft in the statue. And I think I said to you that the guide said she's walking from the medieval world to the modern world. Fair comment. I would rather put it like this. She's walking from religious bondage to gospel freedom. And you know, that's one of the benefits of the Reformation. It was emphasized that every Christian had a calling. There were not some super saints who lived in caves as hermits or super saints who lived in convents or monasteries. No, the people of God have to re reflect God's calling upon them in their everyday life, in their home life, their family life, in their work life. And here in particular, getting back to Paul and Galatians, through our, our relationship with each other is really emphasized in this passage. So much so, I'm sure we all noticed it in the reading. Both in the works of the flesh and in the fruit of the Spirit, you'll see a great deal that really applies to our relations with our fellow Christians. That's where our sanctification is tested, oftentimes. And that is certainly, hopefully, where our sanctification is developed through our fellowship with our fellow believers. Paul says, don't use this liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's a remarkable statement, a remarkable statement that we're called to liberty, but that liberty is a form of service. Indeed, it's actually a form of slavery if we render it literally. One expositor puts, paraphrases that, that clause as follows, to act as slaves to one another in love. 
to act as slaves to one another in love. That's Douglas Moo, who's a leading contemporary um, biblical expositor. To act as slaves together in love. That's remarkable, isn't it? What does that actually mean, though, in practice? Clear that as metaphorical language. Well, I think what it means is this. We are to be committed, as Christians, we are to be, to be committed to selfless, sacrificial concern for others, seeking the, their highest and best worth. We would be committed to selfless, sacrificial concern for others to do the best for them and to bring and act in their best interests. You know, the only person who's ever done that fully is the Lord Jesus. But that's really what we are called to do. Notice the text, through love serve one another. Through love be slaves to one another. That's an astonishing statement. That's freedom. That's freedom. Gospel freedom, I repeat, is not liberty to sin. It's liberty to serve, to serve God, and now to serve others. One of the church fathers, a man called Augustine, said on one occasion, in your service is perfect freedom. In your service is perfect freedom. I know some people like the hymn by, uh, by Matheson, um, and it expresses it very well. Not, O love, that will not let me go. I've no problems with that, but that's not the hymn I have in mind. Make me a captive, Lord. That's profound, isn't it? Paradoxical, yet profound. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conqueror be. That, I think, expresses poetically very, very well what Paul is saying here. Use our liberty to serve one another, to aim for the highest and best good of our fellow believers in, in, in the church fellowship. So, that's the first one, liberty or license. The second is flesh or spirit. Now, we've already noticed that the flesh has been mentioned. It's been mentioned in verse number 13. So now we have to describe it. We've described it, I hope correctly, as the fifth columnist, columnist in all of our hearts. The flesh ultimately is the capital I. The flesh ultimately is the capital I. Now, I want to say tonight, I know some dear believers take a different view that we never lose the flesh. It's with us to the end of the journey. We'll never improve the flesh. It's still what it always was, evil and wicked. Evil and wicked. You know, at the end of a very, very fruitful life of service, looking back on it all, the great hymn writer and preacher John Newton puts it as, my memory is going, but two things I do remember. Number one, I am, I am notice, not I was, I am a great sinner. And secondly, that Christ is a great saviour. But you know, the flesh will never leave us. It's always there, the flesh and the spirit. The self-centred, wicked nature, we never lose it. We keep it to the end of the journey, but we are, in, I trust, in constant conflict with us. That's the point we have in verse number 17, in constant conflict with us. The spirit and the flesh, ESV renders it, are opposed to each other. There's a constant battle in the believer's life. You know, at one level, that's very encouraging. We might think sometimes when we fall into failure and at least have real problems with temptation, that proves that we're not a Christian. Nonsense, the very opposite. That proves we are a Christian. That actually gives us assurance. That proves that we are a Christian. If we are engaged in conflict with the flesh, then we know that we are actually believers. For every believer is involved in a conflict with the flesh. Not that the believer struggles in his own, in his own right, her own right. We do so impair, empowered and enabled by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the great text of the passage. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There is a battle going on, but what's the result of it? It keeps you from doing the things you want to do. Now, I take that positively. In other words, what I'm saying is this. Reading the whole section in, con in context, I believe the apostle is saying, in the case of the true believer, there will at least be some, however small, deliverance from the flesh in their life. And who provides that? The Holy Spirit of God. And here's the command, walk in the Spirit. Now, that's obviously metaphorical language. It means, in other words, just the daily tasks of life, just every day, step by step, mile by mile, in our experience, walking. But we are called to walk by the Spirit or walk in the Spirit. That means 
to be empowered, to be enabled by the Holy Spirit of God. I came across a very good description of walking in the Spirit once, and uh, I'm going to share it with you. I think it's helpful. I think sometimes we get very mystical about these things, and this section, this little uh, quote, I think, renders it a wee bit less mystical. It's not spiritual rock, rocket science, is it? He, th this brother writes as follows, Walking by the Spirit means living as a Christian with all your heart. Point two, it means feeding on the means of grace. That's maybe not a phrase we use so much in assembly circles, but we've got no problem with the principle behind it. The means of grace, the Word of God. The means of grace, prayer. The means of grace, fellowship with the Lord's people. The means of grace, coming to hear the Word of God preached. There may be others, but these are the main means of grace. So, first of all, walking as, walking as a Christian, uh, living as a Christian with all your heart. Secondly, it means feeding on the means of grace. Thirdly, it means obedience, turning away from sin. It means obedience, turning away from sin. Now, some of us find it difficult enough to carry all of these out, but I think these apparently quite straightforward things, I think he's right, this writer. I think he's absolutely right. That is walking in the Spirit. Walking empowered by the Spirit and enabled by the Spirit. So flesh and Spirit are engaged in conflict. We've seen, first of all, that we're called to liberty, not to license. But secondly, we've received the Holy Spirit. Remember chapter 3, verse 2, is it? Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or did you receive him by, by the flesh, by, by, by hearing with faith? No. When we got saved, to put our terminology, we received the Holy Spirit of God. When we heard and believed the gospel, not only were we justified, but that same simple faith gave us the personal, present possession of the Holy Spirit of God. And one of the works the Holy Spirit does is he enables us and assists us in this battle and gives us at least a measure of significant deliverance from the flesh. So we're called to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And the promise is given that by that means we will not gratify the desires of the flesh and we will be kept from doing things that we perhaps otherwise would want to do by the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit of God. But you might ask me tonight, well, how will I know? And that brings us to our third point, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, there was a great preacher um, who died in the early 50s among our circles. His name was Harold Sinjin. And um, he had a sermon in this passage which he entitled Factory or Garden? Factory or Garden? Now, he was speaking of a kind of factory before the Health and Safety at Work Act came into force. He was depicting a factory like one of the dark satanic mills, you know, a noisy place, a smelly place, a dangerous place. And he said, that's the works of the flesh. That's the picture of the works of the flesh. In contrast, you move from the factory, you go into the garden, a place of peace, a place of artistic, laid out in an artistic way, a place of beauty, a place of calm, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. Notice the deliberate use of different words, the works of the flesh. That's what St. John was trying to bring out, and in contrast, the fruit of the Spirit. Why do we call it the fruit of the Spirit? Well, number one, I think, because this is something that's living. Just as fruit is living, so this is living. It's organic. And indeed, it's supernatural. It's supernatural in the proper sense of the word. It's supernatural because it can only be the Holy Spirit who produces the fruit of the Spirit. There is no law against these things, says Paul. What I think that means is this. They cannot be produced by law, even by the law of Moses. They can only be produced by the Holy Spirit of God. And then also the idea of fruit is not only it's organic, it's living, not only is it... Um, supernatural by the Holy Spirit, but there should be, there should be, just as there is in the case of fruit, a measure of growth, a measure of growth and development. You know, at the end of each year, we should have made a wee bit of progress by comparison with the year before. Grow in grace, says Peter, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So that's the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I'm not going to spend much time in the works of the flesh, Notice Paul says they're evident, they're evident. They fall into one or two groups, don't they? First of all, the sexual lust brought before us. And then after that, we have 
Religious sins. The flesh can be religious. We have idolatry and we've got sorcery. And then we come to this, a whole list of things that are brought out in our relations with one another. Notice we have, we're going to see in a minute, we have that in the fruit of the Spirit. We also have it in the works of the flesh. Look at what we have here. Just picking a few at random. Enmity, strife, jealousy, dissensions, divisions, envy. There's a few others. These are all things that are expressed in our relationship with others. You know, that's one of the problems that the Galatians were having. Just cast your eye up to verse 15. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. There was a preacher from Northern Ireland, he's a friend of Willie's, and I heard him on one occasion preaching in this text. And whether it was sound exegesis, I'm not quite so sure, but it certainly reminded one of the truth of the text. You notice it says they bite and devour one another. And Mr. Harold Paisley, for he it was, said, you would have thought they were Alsatians rather than Galatians. <laughs> you know, at least it's memorable, isn't it? At least it's memorable if you bite and devour one another, you know? Pathetic, isn't it? It wasn't just the churches of Galatia that knew that experience. Now, again, metaphorical. It wasn't just the churches of Galatia. There are churches today, if I may say so, where these issues can somehow get as bad as that, biting and devouring. How pathetic, how contrary to God's ideal for his people. And with a sigh of relief, we move on to the fruit of the Spirit. Except I just also mentioned the last of the little bunch of the works of the flesh are um, intemperance. Paul speaks here of drunkenness and orgies and such like. And Paul says, I warn you about these things. If you make these things a practice of life, any of these things perhaps reveals you are never a Christian to begin with. That's how solemn this is. How important then for me and for each of you to walk in the Spirit, not to gratify the desires and the deeds and the works of the flesh, but rather to produce the fruit of the Spirit. So a sigh of relief, we move to the fruit of the Spirit. Let me just say, before we go any further, the key, I think, to understanding the fruit of the Spirit is this. One great expositor of Galatians puts it like this. It's the reproduction of the character and then the, then the conduct of Christ in the lives of his people. It's a high standard, isn't it? But that's what the Holy Spirit is driving at. That's part of his role. He shall glorify me. And one of the many dimensions of that glorification ministry of the Lord Jesus is surely this, that in the lives of God's people, there might be brought forth features that supremely and perfectly, it will never be done in any other case perfectly, but supremely and perfectly were seen in the character and therefore in the conduct of the Lord Jesus. And you know, it's a very helpful study to take each aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, the ninefold fruit, and see how they were fulfilled fully and completely in the, lives of this, in the life of the Savior. That's God's goal for us, my dear friends. We might be like Christ. That's his ultimate goal. That's his ultimate goal for us. Romans chapter 8, that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. But you know, this is the practical dimension. Even here in this life, we should aspire by the grace of the Holy Spirit. I must go on emphasizing that. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, not just to be delivered and left in a vacuum, but rather that positively Christ's conduct might be seen in our lives. So let's turn now to the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Notice the section in verse 22 begins with, but in contrast to the works of the flesh, but... Here is the fruit of the Spirit. And what does Paul say? Love, joy, peace. There's a verse in Colossians that says that love is that which binds all the virtues together. Binds all the virtues together. The Lord Jesus said, did he not to his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples because of your orthodoxy and doctrine? Did he say that? No. Because of your love to one another. You know, this will all men know. This is, a discern, this is a remarkable thing. Christians can be... One of, the, one of the early fathers, again, just about the second century said, see how these Christians love one another. That's the very opposite of the Alsatians, isn't it? Very opposite. See how these Christians love one another. I wonder, is that true? The watching world, do we, do we present that picture? Love is the first aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Love to God. 
But I think also in context, as we've already mentioned, love to each other. We've already dealt with this in verse number 13. Here's love coming back again in verse number 22. You know, some people rightly have said that John is the apostle of love, but so is Paul. You know, the, love is mentioned in the Pauline epistles more than 70 times. Sometimes we forget that. And Paul is just as much an apostle of love as John is, and he puts love first in this list. Do we love one another? And do we love them on another in the sense of seeking the highest and best good of each other brother or sister? Do we have a loving concern for our families, our neighbours, folks who are not yet saved? Above all, do we love God? Do we love God? Do we love our neighbour? Paul has brought that into our attention already. The law can be summed up in that phrase. So that was God's original intention. And now he gives the power by the Holy Spirit for that command to be exercised, for that command to be put into practice, love. And then there's joy. I think we have two extremes here. First of all, there are some people who think there's a kind of aimless, kind of um, effervescent kind of thing. And there's others, a brother of mine, a brother said to me one occasion, you know, we believe in joy, but not many folk would, but would think that looking at us. You know, it's a, it's a balance once again, isn't it? It's a balance. This is true joy, real joy. You know, there are things in the world, I, talk, I mean the world in the neutral sense, the created world, that God has given us in creation and providence. So let me say as clearly as I can that the Christian can enjoy these things just as much, perhaps even more, than the unsaved person. Let me make that point. But I think the joy here is something deeper even than that. Remember what, what, what the, the psalmist David says in Psalm 51? Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Remember what Paul writes to the Philippians? Rejoice in the Lord. Remember what he writes to the Romans? We rejoice or we glory in God who has given us the reconciliation. So, my dear friends, this is a challenging call. It, it doesn't depend on circumstances. This attitude of joy, this attitude of joy, it's something that can exist apart from circumstances. That's what Paul's experience. You've probably heard many preachers say, joy from the jail, you know, when they're expounding Philippians. And despite Paul's difficult circumstances, out of that very prison in Rome, he writes, as I mentioned a minute ago, rejoice in the Lord. So, my dear friend, we're called to true joy, true joy. Not some kind of superficial, effer effervescent joy. And I know the way this is expressed will partly depend on our natural personality, but the believer is to be marked by love, and the believer is to be marked by joy. Remember the Lord Jesus said in the upper room, my joy, my joy might remain with you. And then he said, my peace might remain with you. So it's not surprisingly, joy and and love are followed by peace. This is wholeness. This is harmony. It's really all the benefits of salvation. But again, it's living, not just knowing the peace with God, though that's vital, that's foundational, but moving on to the peace of God. And you know, that should also be true in our relations with each other. There should be that aspect of peace. God's desire is there should be peace among brethren. So, there's love, joy, and peace. And then we come to the, to the virtue translated by the ESV, patience, by the authorizer, King James Version, long-suffering, long-suffering. You know, what does long-suffering mean? Well, we all know what it means to be short-tempered. No doubt we see it in other people. Right? We all know what it means to be short-tempered. If, we if there was this word in English, and I don't think there is, I didn't actually check in chambers when, before I left the house, but if there was such a word in English, it would be being long-tempered. But I don't think there is such a word. But that's the word translated here, long-suffering, and in the ESV translated patience, long-suffering. You know, R.C. Chapman, one of the early brethren, and he was the leader in a church that gathered in Barnstable in Devon, and a brother whose name is not known to history for reasons that will soon become apparent, joined them in Barnstaple. And some of his friends said to Chapman, who lived in neighbouring towns, did Brother X come among you? Well, how are you getting on? Brother X is a real difficult customer. Chap you know what Chapman replied? We never knew our need of patience until Brother X came among us. So he was putting that down to a means by which we were growing in grace. You know, long-suffering, 
dealing with difficult people. You know, there are such okay, one or two you might meet, difficult people. And difficult circumstances, you know, that can only come supernaturally by the grace of the Holy Spirit of God. You know, this is not just some kind of simple kind of thing. This is something that's part of the work of the Holy Spirit to produce in us patience. There's another word for patience in the Old New Testament, usually translated by the modern versions, endurance. And they're both necessary. They're both necessary. They're both very, very important. This is the idea of long suffering, dealing with difficult situations, difficult people. And again, this part of the fruit of the fruit of the Spirit that we might be marked by patience. Then kindness. You know, again, we're back now to a positive virtue. And again, I'm, I know I'm stressing this, but I'm doing it deliberately. Again, that which is developed and tested in our relations with one another. Am I kind? Am I kind in my disposition? Am I kind in the sense that I'm eager to help other people in the best way I can to get to use some of my time, my talents, my treasure in the help and benefit of my fellow believers? That's being kind. Elsewhere in the New Testament we read that God is kind. God is kind. And you know, we his people are called to follow in our small measure in his steps, to be marked by kindness. Are we kind to others? And the next word is almost indistinguishable. They're very, very close in meaning. Goodness, goodness. Now, there's two meanings of the word goodness here. The first is just moral beauty, goodness in that very general sense of moral beauty. But the second is the one that's very closely related to kindness. Goodness is being generous. Goodness is being, is being benevolent. I wonder, are we like that? Or are we tight-fisted, you know? Are we tight-fisted? No, I repeat, we are called to be generous, generous with our time, generous with our prayers, generous in our giving, just helping other people, no doubt people in general. Indeed, it means people in general. Paul hits the nail on the head in chapter 6. Do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. And that just sums up what he's already saying in the fruit of the Spirit. Do good to all men, to all people. Um, and that's the practical manifestation of it, as I've said, being benevolent and being generous in all that we do. And then Paul goes on to say faithfulness. I know it can be rendered faith, but I think faithfulness is a better translation. This means being reliable. You know, sometimes some issue arises, some practical work to be done in a church or fellowship, and some people put their hands up right away, volunteering. But when their work actually starts, they're nowhere to be seen. No, we shouldn't really be like that. I'm not saying any of you are. I don't know you well enough. But, uh, but we shouldn't be like that. We should be reliable. We should be dependable. If we say we're going to do something, we should do our very best. I know it's not always possible. I know it's not always possible. We should really do our best to do it and carry it out. And again, I ask myself first, what, which of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are seen in my life? Is any? I ask you to challenge yourself too. Are you marked by goodness? Are you marked by reliability? Are you marked by love, by joy, by peace, by patience, goodness? Yes, faithfulness, faithfulness, being dependable, being reliable, being trustworthy in all that we do. And then here's the remarkable one, translated meekness in the King James, translated gentleness in the ESV. You know, the Lord Jesus had virtue in all perfection. But so far as I can find out, the only virtue he specifically claimed to have was when he said, I am meek. Same word as here. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Isn't that amazing? That is the supreme declaration of Christ. I am meek. I am gentle. I am lowly in heart. What a statement to make. And what a call for us to follow in this state. Oh, patient, spotless one, our hearts in meekness train to bear thy yoke and learn of thee and we may rest obtain. Saviour, thou art enough, the mind and heart to fill, thy love to meet, fill the anxious soul, thy peace its fears dispel. You know, he is the patient, spotless one. He, our, our hearts in meekness train. What is meekness? Very hard to define. You probably heard other preachers say, and they said it correctly, that meekness is not weakness. The world thinks it's weak, it's weakness, not weakness. It's actually strength under control. And it actually means strength under control. This is meekness or gentleness. Am I rough? Am I abrasive? Am I arrogant to other people? 
Even people who are not believers, am I like that? How contrary to the spirit of Christ. You know, the world mocks this attitude, doesn't it? It says, just like a doormat, aren't you? No, we're not called to be doormats, but we're called to be meek. We're called to be gentle in all our dealings. It's really best defined negatively. It means the very opposite to being self-centered. The very opposite to being self-centered. So there's a sense then, if we think of the flesh, we're back where we started, as being the capital I, as we think of the flesh as being the supreme example of independence of God, of being taken up oneself in everything we do, then meekness is the absolute opposite, the absolute opposite, the absolute opposite of that. Meekness is gentleness, but it also means being freed. We trust increasingly from this self-centered and selfish spirit. Let's not kid ourselves. We all have that to a greater or lesser degree. But you know, it's possible by the grace of the spirit to grow in this grace too, to grow in meekness or gentleness, as well as in moral goodness and all the rest. So Paul says here very clearly, in our relations with others, particularly our fellow Christians, but not exclusively, we have to show these virtues. We have to show virtues like kindness, like patience, like goodness, like faithfulness, like gentleness. What a, what a thing to aim for. The world despises it. The world rejects it. You know, there was a German philosopher called Nietzsche, and he said, this awful Christian business. Not surprising that Nietzsche was a great favorite writer of Adolf Hitler, is it? Totally despised the weakness, as he saw it, of the Nazarene. But, you know, we take our stand with Christ, don't we? We say he is meek, he is gentle, and by God's grace I would seek to be like that in some small measure as well. And then finally, there is self-control. There is self-control. Well, that's some contrast to the list of the deeds of the flesh, the works of the flesh. We look at the works of the flesh and they contrast very clearly to these ninefold fruits of the Spirit we've dealt with. And the last one, particularly in contrast to the sexual lust with which the list began and the drunkenness and orgies with which the list ended, we are called to be marked by self-control. We are called to be marked by self-control. How relevant, how vital in the day and age in which we live. You know, but the day and age in which we live is in many ways just the return of the first century world. <laughs> That's the interesting thing. We as Christians are living in a culture now that is less and less being molded and shaped by Christian ethics the way it has been for centuries. And we're fast becoming more like the first century world. The Lord's people were faithful then, very faithful then. We, are, we may be called yet to be as faithful as they were. But here we're called to be marked by self-control, not to practice these deeds of the flesh, these works of the flesh, but to retreat Yes, into the garden to keep the metaphor and see something of the fruit of the Spirit flourishing in our lives from day to day. And as we need, notice the last clause of verse 23, it emphasizes what the passage has been saying in general. The law will not sanctify any more than it will justify. The law is against things by the, on the whole, and there's not a, but it is not against any of these things. But it doesn't have the power on its own. The emphasis, I deliberately re-emphasize, is that the Holy Spirit is the one who produces these aspects of virtues in our lives. But then in verse 24, there's another aspect of the dynamic of sanctification. Here's another great truth that comes into play. Not just the work of the Holy Spirit, but here in verse 44, verse 24, we're reminded of the truth we've mentioned several times in these studies of union with Christ of union with Christ. Remember the classic statement, Galatians chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So every believer can say that. When we trust Christ, not only is it true that Christ died for me, but it's also true that I died in him. I died in him. Paul's going to say much the same in chapter 6, by which the cross of Christ, the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. And here in verse 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What I think that means is this. We've judged the flesh to be worthy of death. We've pronounced that sentence, and by the Spirit's help, we have just, we have enabled to carry it out. We have, we have crucified the flesh in the sense that we have pronounced the sentence and we have executed it. 
It's similar to Romans chapter 6, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. When we trusted Christ, we turned from sin. The biblical word is repented. And I think this is an example here of repentance and union with Christ brought together in verse 24. Those who belong to Christ have taken their stand with him and have grasped, increasingly we hope as the years go by, that when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose in him. And that's part of the dynamic too of sanctification. This Holy Spirit, but also grasping that we're united to Christ. That means that the sentence has been pronounced. The, the flesh has been definitively judged. Still there, but it's been definitively judged by us. It's remaining, but thank God it's no longer reigning. That's the great truth of these verses. It's remaining, but thank God it's no longer reigning by the power of the Spirit and by the grace of God in, in, in union with Christ. Yeah. So the power of the flesh in that sense has been broken and now we can walk in newness of life. If we live by the Spirit, now every Christian really is living by the Spirit, greater or lesser degrees, when we're brought into the sphere of the Spirit. Here's another word for walk that the ESV and I think the NIV both quite accurately paraphrase let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So here we have two walks, but they're not contradicting one another. They're just slightly different metaphors of the work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the one we've been stressing more, verse, nine, verse 16, we're walking empowered and enabled by the Holy Spirit of God day by day. And then in verse 25, it's a slightly different thought. It's walking in the direction that the Spirit indicates. Now, there was a man called Thoreau. You might have heard of him. He's one of the founders, looking back, one of the present environmentalist movement. And he lived near the great city of Boston in the United States. And um, he, he spent his time on an island, you know, just communing with nature. Now, you might have seen a statement of his. Occasionally, you see it hanging up on people's walls. If you see some, I'm paraphrasing, it's, it's snappier than this, but I'm giving you the gist of it. If you see someone living in a way different from you, don't interfere with him, for he might be marching to a different drummer. You've probably heard her said a quote somewhere. or a, That came from Thoreau. You know, there's a lot of truth in it. And as far as the Christian is concerned, we're marching to a different drummer, aren't we? Maybe as the world looks on and sees things, it seems to be a wee bit strange. In a good sense, I trust. And that's the answer. We are marching to a different drummer. We are not marching to the world's drum. We're marching to the drum that's beaten by the Holy Spirit of God. That, I think, is the force. We're walking by the Spirit, enabled, empowered. We're walking by the Spirit under his direction. And in the direction he directs, by the word of God. And we seek to pay heed to that drum that's sounding. And to walk in step, keep in step with the Spirit. To march in step with him by the beat of that drum, the drum of the Holy Spirit of God. And then finally, the apostle comes back to personal relationships, doesn't he? There must have been a problem. We can see that very clearly in verse 15, you know, the biting and devouring. There must have been a problem along these lines in the Galatian churches. Whether that was partly provoked by the coming of the false teachers or not, we can't be sure. Here's the negative side now. We've dealt with the positive and we're back at the negative again. Let us not become conceited. You know, the believer should flee this, this idea of self-importance and nobody equal to me kind of business. And then he also says, provoking one another. Let's seek, the person who's meek, the person who's gentle will not deliberately provoke another. And then we have this one, envying one another. You know, there's a difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy is bad and bad enough, but envy is far worse. Let me draw the distinction, because this word for envy is used correctly here. Notice it's already been used as one of the works of the flesh. Did you notice that? One of the works of the flesh is envy. And here we're called not to envy one another. Jealousy desires that I might have what the other person has, but I'm not greatly concerned if he keeps it as well. Envy is far worse. Envy takes rejoices in other people's misfortunes. Envy is what it means you want them to lose that. It doesn't really matter if you get, get it as well. Maybe you're not concerned. You're not concerned about whether you'll get the same thing. Envy means you want that person deprived of what he's got. It's an awful thing, isn't it? 
You know, that's what the evangelist writes in the Gospels about the high priests. Pilate knew it was for envy. It was for envy that delivered Jesus up to have him crucified. You know, let's flee envy, rejoicing in other people's misfortunes. Let's flee envy, desiring not to, that they might not have what they have, even irrespective of whether I get the same. No, the Christian's attitude should be entirely different. Let's go back to where we started a wee while ago. This is the reproduction. The fruit of the Spirit is the reproduction of the character and therefore the conduct of Christ in the lives of his people. And I leave it with you. You know, here is a very positive part of this epistle. The gospel of God's grace not only brings us justification, it brings us sanctification. And ultimately, it will bring us glorification. Though that's not particularly in Paul's mind in Galatians. But what a privilege to be those who have heard and believed that gospel. What a privilege to believe that there is no other gospel and to stand fast with it and for Christ tonight in this day and age in which we live. For here we're reminded in this doctrinal and also ethical and practical section of the epistle that we are called to liberty, brethren. We are called to liberty. But let not that liberty be an opportunity for the flesh. Let it not be used so as to disparage the gospel and disparage the people of God. But that let us show in our lives the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We've only dealt a few minutes with each of them, but what a picture, what a portrait. I ask myself, this is the big question at the end of all this. If I examine my life honestly, which is more prominent? Is it the deeds of the flesh, the works of the flesh, or is it the fruit of the Spirit? You see, at the end of the day, that's the punchline in this whole passage. How will I know who I'm walking by the Spirit? By asking myself this question, what is there more evident in my life? Is it all the works of the flesh, even as a believer? Or is it, at least to some small degree, the fruit of the Spirit? And if it is, then we can be sure and certain the Holy Spirit has come, he's indwelling, and by his grace. But our responsibility is to submit ourselves to him. Our responsibility is to present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead and thus be empowered so that our life, if we examine it, and perhaps even as others see it, might be more of the fruit of the Spirit seen from the future. We trust rather than the works of the flesh. May God bless his word to our heart. I think, Willie, you're going to close in prayer. The, the elders felt it was appropriate that this last Sunday evening of February we should just thank Alan for having been with us over this month. It's been a real treat, hasn't it? I, I, I should, uh, should not make any compliments to Alan. I know that he doesn't like that, and quite wisely he would say no, uh, because we were talking about this last week, that... I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who, on one occasion, somebody said to him at the door of the church, said, that was a great sermon. He said, yes, Satan told me that two minutes ago. <laughs> and uh, so we have to be careful about that sort of thing. I first heard Alan preach more than 50 years ago, and uh, <laughs> that was through in Fife. And we, o we only invited the best of Glasgow's <laughs> preachers uh, through to Fife. But it's been lovely to have him with us this month. This week, some of you, I know, get the We Flee uh, blog, uh, David Robertson. And he had one of his blogs this week was, Why Bother Listening to Preaching? Well, of course, he was emphasizing there that God, in a very special way, ministers to his people through the preaching of his word in a way that he doesn't do with anything else. And certainly God has ministered, the Lord has ministered to us over this last month. So thank you, Alan, thank for you. being with us. And let when me I just hear men sorry. speaking of this 50 years ago, I begin to feel as if somebody like David Gooding or Elvis <laughs> Wilson or <laughs> someone like that. Yes, I'm, I, only, I'm only in my 70s, I'm not quite in my 80s, no, no, 90s. I that, no, no. <laughs> let us just pray, though, and uh, ask God's blessing. Eternal God, our 
loving Father, we thank you that it has been good for us on this the Lord's Day to be in the Lord's house. We thank you that earlier we were at the Lord's table to remember him. We thank you tonight that we've been reading from your word and we thank you for the preaching of your word this evening. Thank you that it convicts us, it encourages us, it motivates us and inspires us. And we thank you for that tonight. And so bless your servant and we thank you for his wife, Elizabeth. Bless them and encourage them in their ministry. And for us all this week, we pray that there would be something of Christ seen, up, seen in us, mm -hmm. in the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And so we ask your blessing, your parting blessing now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.